After six dark years, the population of Europe are jubilant that for them the war is finally over. The joint efforts of the Allies had defeated the once seemingly invincible Nazi war machine. In a small town called Potsdam, just west of Berlin, the big three Allied leaders, Truman, Churchill and Stalin, are meeting to discuss what is to be done with the defeated Germany, her people and the territory she had once held. It is also a chance for the three to celebrate the end of the conflict in Europe, congratulate each other and mark their victory. At the conference it was all smiles and handshakes for the cameras, a triumph. Comrades celebrating their combined efforts towards victory, a moment for the Allied world to savour. However, under the surface and behind closed doors it was anything but cordial and friendly. Arguments raged for the entire duration of the conference as the spoils of war were deliberated over. Stalin saying of Churchill, he will betray anyone he thinks is weaker than himself, and Truman even calling Stalin a son of a bitch upon hearing of his outrageously large war reparation demands. By the time the conference had ended, it was clear. The Potsdam Conference may have marked the end of one war, but it very much signalled the beginning of the next. Two days later on the 4th of August 1945, at a ceremony in Moscow, William Avril Harriman, the newly appointed American ambassador to the USSR, was presented with a gift as a gesture of friendship to the Soviet Union's war ally by a group of children from the Vladimir Lenin All-Union Pioneer Organization of the Soviet Union. <laughs> The gift was a wooden carving of the Great Seal of the United States, the Great Seal being the coat of arms of the United States, an official emblem, mark of identification and symbol of the authority of the United States government. The gift would turn out to be a perfect metaphor of what was to come in the subsequent decades and mirrored what had happened a few days earlier at the Potsdam Conference as behind the thin veneer of friendship, something much more sinister was lurking. As a proud American, Ambassador Harriman duly hung the gift above his desk in his private study. However, unfortunately for the ambassador, he had just bugged his own study. The very same study where he would talk confidentially to the President of the United States on all matters pertaining to Russia. With a device so advanced, it was considered an impossibility at the time. The ambassador had hung on his wall an undetectable listening device that required no wires and no power source, that had the ability to allow Stalin's secret police to eavesdrop on every word that was uttered in his office. An inconceivable achievement for Lavrente Beria, the head of Stalin's secret police and the most feared man in the whole of the USSR. This unique device hanging on the ambassador's wall was designed by Leon Theremin, a talented inventor with an affinity for electrical engineering. His most famous invention being the world's first electrical instrument that also bared his name, the theremin. And it was the theremin that brought him to the attention of Lavrente Beria, who upon theremin's return to Russia from a tour promoting his instrument, promptly imprisoned theremin in the Gulag. He put his brain to work in an experimental design bureau with other well-known legendary Russian engineers and scientists, such as aeronautical engineer Andrei Tupolev, the designer of many groundbreaking Russian military and civilian aircraft, and Sergei Korolev, who would go on to lead the Soviet space program, launching his brainchild Sputnik into space atop one of his rockets. And it was here, surrounded by his peers, and with the constant threat of execution, he designed the impossible. Theremin's expertly designed device consisted of very few parts. Essentially, a diaphragm in front of a tuning post that sat in a cavity with an antenna attached, all of which was easily concealed within the 61 centimeter diameter of the wooden seal. But without a power source, how could it work? Well, for it to work, it did require a power source. And this power source was delivered externally via a powerful microwave beam aimed at the seal from a van parked across the street from the ambassador's residence. As the beam was fired at the building, the device sprang into life, relaying the conversations that were being held in its presence. Then, when the microwave emitter was turned off, it returned to its inert and completely undetectable state. 
It listened into the secret conversations of five ambassadors across seven years, surviving multiple redecorations of the study and building sweeps where it evaded special anti-espionage units that would comb the building from top to bottom looking for nefarious devices. The device was only discovered in 1952 by a British Army radio operator who happened to be scanning through frequencies and completely by accident overheard American voices. This was reported to the Americans who then finally managed to identify the gift of friendship as a Cold War Trojan horse. The device was promptly removed and taken away to a military laboratory where it was dissected, studied and reverse engineered. The British and Americans quickly replicating the technology and putting their own versions of the device into practical use all around the globe. Embarrassed that they had unwittingly been spied on for the last seven years, the device was never made public to save their blushes. Until May the 26th, 1960, in the aftermath of the downing of Lieutenant Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane by a Russian SAM missile. At a UN Security Council meeting, the device was finally revealed. After four days of intense Russian accusations against the US, whilst vehemently denying that they, the Russians, would ever spy on another nation, the device was revealed in detail for the world to see, showing that yes, whilst the Americans were spying, the Russians weren't quite the victimised innocent party they were making themselves out to be. So what legacy did Theremin's invention leave on the world? By the 1960s, the officially named Passive Cavity Resonator device had become a redundant piece of technology. As with the prevalence of televisions, the powerful microwaves needed to activate the device would scramble any television signals, alerting possible targets to the device's presence. However, in the last 10 years, the technology has had a strong resurgence. Theremin's device has been credited as the grandfather to radio frequency identification, or RFID as it's commonly known, something that we all use daily in our lives. From contactless payment devices, to event tickets and wristbands, electronic keys, and they are even embedded in our pets in case they get lost. These modern devices use the very same principle as theremins, where the object in hand remains passive until it is presented near a reader that is emitting radio waves. The object then comes to life once in the radius of these waves, and a signal is sent that the reader receives. RFID is an amazing technology that has limitless potential. It is the technology that many retailers, including Amazon, are building their checkout free shops around. With an RFID tag built into the product, you can just pick it up and walk out without ever having to queue. There are even plans to create microscopic RFID chips and put them in our bloodstream to help monitor our health. Sounds great. Or is history going to repeat itself? where we as a population are given a gift of convenience, but behind the guile of technology improving our lives, it is in reality keeping tabs on us and is another step towards mass surveillance and government spying on their population. What do you think? Thanks for watching this episode of Behind Designs. Please make sure to like, share and subscribe.